Hello, I'm Mary Whitehouse and I'm at the University of York in the Science Education Group there. And this morning I'm going to talk about how we use research evidence in our curriculum development projects. My name is Mary Whitehouse and I work at the University of York in the Science Education Group there. And um, the University of York Science Education Group is uh, internationally known for its curriculum development in, in science, secondary science and education. Um, if you've heard of the Salter Science Projects, they all came out of there in 21st century science. And I'm going to talk today about how we use research to inform our curriculum development. And the, the project I'm going to sort of illustrate the talk with is um, a Key Stage 3 project that we've been doing for the last couple of years. And the reason that we're sort of working with key on Key Stage 3 is because there have been a few issues with Key Stage 3 science. <laughs> A few years ago, the SATs were dropped, um, and some teachers, science teachers, said, "What are we going to do now? You know, what do we, what do we do? What have we got to teach for? Uh, what's, the, what's the target of our teaching if we don't have SATs?" So that led to sort of a loss of focus, really. Um, and there are also concerns about student progression during Key Stage Three and concerns about students losing interest in science. They come into school, secondary school, very interested in science and during the course of key stage three they lose some of that interest there's quite a lot of research evidence uh, to show that they lose they're still interested in science but they're not interested in school science hello um, I'm in, um, yes uh, oh sorry uh, middle school 11 to 14 yeah. age 11 to 14 so concerns about progression over that time and uh, so something that's new that's come to me recently is the relationship between what happens in the first three years of secondary school and what happens after that in GCSE. Everybody has to do GCSE science. And after the SATs dropped, were dropped, schools started to teach their GCSE courses a bit earlier, started to teach them in year nine instead of starting in year 10. And now we've got linear GCSEs. There's five years before they have any external assessment. And some teachers, particularly some, perhaps some young teachers whose ex whole experience has been of modular assessment at GCSE, are quite concerned about how they think about the curriculum. And they looked at the GCSE draft criteria that have come out recently, and they've said, how can I cram that into the two years in the years 10 and year 11? Or how can I cram it into three years? And I said, but... It's a five-year thing. Secondary school, it's a GCSE, it's a certificate of secondary education. It's what you've got at the end of five years. And they said, no, 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 but I've got to do it during, you know, start GCSE. I'm like, we don't find the same thing if you talk to maths and English colleagues. They don't think of starting GCSE in year nine or in year 10. They think of secondary education. You're teaching them, they're doing their GCSEs at the end of there. So that's another sort of issue that's come up more recently about Key Stage 3, I think, is trying to work out what the focus is in Key Stage 3 science. Our strap line for York Science is embedding formative assessment. And um, there's a lot of research. Sorry, I'm, you know, I was in here for the beginning of the last talk and he was in sort of saying, oh, research evidence. Phew. But there is a lot of research evidence that... Um, Formative assessment, having clear learning intentions, using formative assessment can improve learning. So our project is about uh, em embedding formative assessment. And the other reason for thinking about assessment is that it's assessment that clarifies what it is you're trying to teach. If you give teachers a new specification, a new syllabus, they might look at the specification, but what they actually look at is the specimen assessment materials. They look at the exam papers, but what is it they're going to have to do at the end? And that was one of the problems when SATs went. SATs went, the national curriculum changed, but what have we got to teach? You know, what, what is it that we're supposed to be doing? So what we feel at York is that we feel we have quite a clear idea of what, what we think is important in school science. It's our view. You know, you don't have to buy into what we think is important, but we thought quite a lot about it. And if that's what we think is important, what would be the questions and tasks that we want students to do to show that they could do those things? And that will help, we think, help teachers clarify what it is they're trying to do 
in their lessons. So that's why we're focusing on formative assessment. And because this is about how we've been informed by the research, I want to look at just talk through a bit of the research that we've had, we've looked at and used. And the most obvious place to start is to talk about Black and William. And the Black and William uh, report, which was um, in 1998, they wrote a big paper, and then they wrote the teacher-friendly version, which a lot of you will have come across, and which you can still buy for Fiverr, or you can download it off the internet from pirate places all over the place, translated into a zillion languages. Uh, found it in Chinese recently. Um, by the way, all the references, if you've got a leaflet, there are leaflets around about what I'm talking about on the back, are all the references, the research references. Uh, and I'll put this up on our website afterwards with the references as well. So Black and William found a lot of evidence that formative, using formative assessment raised standards. Of course, that got hijacked into AFL, into thumbs up, and all sorts of other things which weren't really formative assessment. And Dylan Williams says we shouldn't have called it formative assessment because people have sort of hijacked it and, and it's not really what they're talking about. But formative assessment done well can raise standards. A lot of you here will know uh, about Hattie and the work of Hattie. And what Hattie does is he looks at, he's a New Zealander, uh, and he looks at sort of meta studies. So he looks at other people's research, and in fact he looks at the research that people have done on other people's research, so it's kind of meta-meta studies. But he looks at the data and says, what is it that makes the difference in the classroom? And he, he uses a, a thing, an effect size factor, which Robert Coe is going to be talking about as well, and he has these barometers. If you haven't come across it, just very briefly, effect size is about comparing the difference in scores between a control group and a group that did whatever the intervention was, divided by the standard deviation of the control group. So you can have effect sizes which go from, in his research, from minus 0.2, in other words, an intervention which made matters worse, to up to 1.2. I'm not quite sure what 1.2 is, whether there is anything that's 1.2. And so he looks at what are the things that work. So I, of course, cherry-picked his, his work to find three that chime in with what we're doing, as you do with research. So one of the things that he talks about is feedback. And that's kind of what formative assessment you know, is about. If you asked a lot of students, I asked our undergraduates who are doing an education course what they thought formative assessment was. And we talked about it. And I said, have you experienced this in school, when you were at school? And one of them said, yes. He said it was uh, no comment marking. So that was, so I said, all oh, right, okay, so what was, what was no comment marking? What did you get instead of, sorry, no, no number marking, you know, comment only marking, beg your pardon. So I said, what sort of comments did you get? And they said, oh, he used to write good or very good. I said, <laughs> and I don't think that teacher's quite grasped what this is about. But so that feedback from the teacher to the student is one of the things that formative assessment is about. It's about telling the student what they can do next to do better. But what Hattie says is, actually, What's really effective is what the teacher hears from the students about what they can and can't do. It's the feedback from the student to the, to the teacher which is really effective. So it's finding out from students what their misconceptions are, what they don't know, what they do know, what they can understand, and so on. That's what's really effective. Direct instruction. Now, this is a surprising one. Direct instruction has an effect size of 0 point, nearly 0 0.6, 0 0.5 now. 0.4 is average, so you're looking for things more than that. And you sort of think, when you first hear direct instruction, you think didactic. But it isn't actually. That's not what he means by direct instruction. That's not what the researchers describe as direct instruction. There are seven criteria for what direct instruction is about. The first two are sort of, the first two in his list are the two that I've picked out here. Um, and you can see the rest are on page 205. The book's on the stand down there. Um, but the first two things are the teacher being clear about what the intentions for a lesson are. And Dylan William talks about asking teachers, you know, going into a classroom and asking a teacher what the learning intentions are and then being a bit vague about it. And perhaps even more importantly, the teacher being clear what the success criteria. How will I know that what I intended to teach today 
has been learned. And then in the description of direct instruction, it then goes on to talk about the other activities that are going on in the lesson. It doesn't mean teachers standing at the front for an hour. But it's, a, it's about having a really well-planned lesson which has lots of activities in it, different activities for learning. And that compares to inquiry-based teaching, or inquiry, as they call it in the States, which is getting very big in the States. If you look at what's going on in the States in science education, it's all about more inquiry-based teaching. But Hattie says that it only has an effect size of 0 0.3. So it's probably maybe not the best way to approach all your teaching all the time. And finally, um, this one is about providing formative evaluation of programmes. And I had to read this several times to see what it really meant. It's got an effect size of 0.9, so it's something that's worth thinking about. What is it? Basically, this is about the teacher taking using what happens in the classroom formatively as well. In other words, the teacher thinking about what's working and what's not working. So if the teacher tries out an intervention, tries something out, the teacher knowing whether that improved learning or not. And he says, and Hattie says that that's a really important part. So the teacher's recognising what's going on in the classroom and what's working are the, are the cr crucial things. And the teacher can only know that if they know what learning is going on in the classroom. OK, so that's sort of some of the research which is around assessment and what goes on. So, so some of our rationale for the way the approach we're taking in what we're doing. The implications, we can improve learning outcomes if we help teachers to get good evidence of the learning and help them think about what it is that matters and what they're teaching in their classrooms. And that means sort of helping them embed formative assessment in their class. So if that's what we want to do, help teachers do better formative assessment, how do we go about doing the curriculum development? So that's the, the rationale, the sort of evidence we've got that concentrating on assessment is what matters, we think, in helping teachers. There's loads of schemes of work out there. The publishers all produce schemes of work out there. In the past, what we've done is produced schemes of work to go with exam specifications. We've developed specifications with awarding bodies, and then we've produced the teaching schemes and the textbooks and all of that to go with it. This time, we're not doing that. We're concentrating on just on assessment. So what are the things that are telling us how to go about this? And the first thing is, this is one example of research. This is Wynne Harlan's work on what, how could we improve science education. And what Wynne Harlan is talking about is about what's wrong with what's going on now. And she says, and her group, the group that she worked with, which included science educators and scientists, there's a lack of coherence to science education. Children don't see the connections between the big ideas in science. It's just loads of stuff. So Wynne's work, and she, she based some of that work on the work that uh, Robin Miller at York and Jonathan Osborne, who was then at King's, did, uh, the research which resulted in Beyond 2000. So that work is about how can we help students to see the big picture, see what the story is. And so we've looked at learning progressions. And learning progressions are... Um, kind of a story through the science, thinking about what is the order in which you would want to develop the ideas, in the big ideas in science. Where would you start? What would you want to say before? Which, how are they connected? So if you're saying that, you know, we need to tell the particle model in this order, what does that mean in biology? What does that mean in physics? Using research evidence about students' understanding, to put that in order. Now, this work is going on both in Europe and in the States, probably elsewhere um, in Asia as well. And this, this particular quote, I think, is quite important for, for science education researchers. And what Neumann is saying is that researchers have the tools to help write those progressions. They have to be written. All of these things have to be done working with teachers. And most science education researchers 
will be working with teachers on this sort of thing. To write learning progressions to show how we think the big ideas work. So we've been doing this at York as well, informed by what everybody else is doing. So we need to know about children's understanding. And that first book should really have been at the top of the pile, I think, because if you're a science teacher and you want to know what's going on in children's head, Rod Dri Ros Driver's book is the place to start. So this basic illustration saying there's a whole wealth of places to go for looking at what children understand about science. And some bits of the research about children's understanding are very well trodden. Lots of people do it. Loads, if, you go and if you look, loads of people are doing research on the particle model, on children's understanding of states of matter. Not so many people are doing research on children's understanding of, say, genetics or something like that. So you, digging around to do the research is quite hard work. And that's why... As Norman says, we need people, education researchers, to do this alongside teachers. Teachers don't have the time, the resources to do that kind of research. And the final sort of bit of the model for how we're going to do this work, or how we are doing this work, is this idea of backward design, which I've really kind of alluded to already. A teacher wanting to know how to plan some teaching looks at the exam materials, the assessment materials to plan what they've got to teach. And what Wiggins and McTie have said is we should be looking at what questions we want them to answer during the course of the teaching before we plan what we want to actually teach. This, this material, uh, Understanding by Design, is written really for planning a whole curriculum. So it's about colleges and schools using it. It's written in the States, about colleges and schools using it as the basis for planning a whole curriculum, or for planning um, a year's work. But the same principle applies to planning even a lesson. What do you want the students to be able to do? How will you know they're going to do it? What's the evidence I'm going to have? What do I need to teach to get them there? I've just talked non-stop. Does anybody want to ask any questions before I go on to talk about how we're doing this at York? It's um, the measure. The measure is if you, if you, the, the difference between the mean. So supposing you did an intervention and you tested the students at the end, and you had two groups. So you took the mean score of the groups who've been intervened and the mean score of the control groups, and take those. The difference between those divide by the standard deviation, and that's the effect size, and that's equivalent. And and 0.4 is equivalent to about half a GCSE score so it's 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 about the progress made during a year is another way of measuring it so but robert co later on will be talking a lot more about effect size anything else can i just ask yes not the right time to ask, but um, just uh, the john and Hathi, I, I read the visible learning for teachers mm. and, i mean most of which i've noticed yeah up there but the one thing he seemed in the feedback side of things, which you say is probably formative assessment, that's mm. in there. Mm. He didn't seem to have a kind of there didn't seem to be a, a set of you know which I like I like a set a list of strategies I could try. There just didn't seem. seem I think to uh, yes, I think I think yes. The thing about Hattie, of course, is that he's looked at you know I don't know how many studies yeah. there were in that one. Um, so he's looked at loads of studies and. With any education research, as I think Ben Goldacre did say, you've got to actually look at what went on and who the research was done with and so on. I think in terms of formative... Oh, attacked by the table football. In terms of formative assessment, if I, want, I think that the reading for me would be Dylan Williams' book, which I, I refer to. Uh, no, no, a more recent book, Embedded Formative Assessment. I think that's my sort of very readable, much more readable than Hattie, I have to say. Oh, yes, it's very, very readable. You could sort of... I bought it for my daughter for Christmas, <laughs> which is a terrible thing to do for a mother who's a daughter's a teacher. And then anything else? Uh, do interrupt, do interrupt, because otherwise I'll just sort of, I will do just sort of kind of talk, I'm afraid. Um, so what we're doing in York Science is, first of all, we're thinking about what the core knowledge is, so we're writing um, learning progressions for each topic. Um, and you have to do that, and we'll see you, you do that for the whole of secondary science, even though we're concentrating on key stage three. Then we say, well, what do we want the students to learn from that? Because the first thing is really a list, just a list of stuff. Then we say, 
What do we want students to do to show that they've learned it? What's the evidence of learning? And then, what are the questions and tasks that will provide that evidence? So at the end of the day, we will produce a bank of questions and tasks for science teachers to use. But they're not just a random collection. They, they have a rationale. They fit into our learning progression. And it's very interesting because this is not a linear process. It's an iterative process. Once you start to write questions or try to write questions and tasks, you sometimes realise that what you said you wanted students to learn doesn't make sense. The question or task doesn't match the learning intention. And as um, an examiner, as a GCSE science examiner, I know that's the case because we've written, you write a specification and then in the good old days when specifications lasted five or ten years, at some point, you know, we didn't keep changing them, uh, at some point somebody at the board would say, have you covered every specification point? You know, after sort of four or five years, you should have examined every specification point. And there's always one or two that you've been avoiding because you don't know how to write a question to assess them. And so writing the questions clarifies what you've written for the learning intentions. So in a class, if, you've, if you're planning a lesson and you write down what your learning outcomes are or your learning intentions or whatever you call them, and then you think about how will I know I've met those, if you can't think of a way of finding out whether the students can do those things that you, you said, then maybe your learning intentions aren't quite clear enough. Yes? I'm going to give some examples. Give some examples. So hopefully that will make it clearer. So I'm going to give an example. And this is an example from um, sort of chemistry. And I've talked a bit about the particle model. So this here, which obviously you can't read, but you could down, you could maybe you could download it on our website. Maybe you could, or maybe you couldn't. But if you really wanted it, I could email it you. So this is a word document which says what we think students should be finding out about. The particle model, the properties of matter in terms of structure and bonding is the heading at the top. So key stage one, key stage two, key stage three, key stage four. So key stage one is nothing to do with the particle model. Key stage one says um, that there are different kinds of materials and they have different properties, basically. So that's a progression. It's just a list of the science stuff that you need to know. And we think we've sort of compartmentalised it into different st key stages within secondary and first primary and secondary science. It's, quite, it's, it's not un, unsimilar to some of the things you'd find in the 1999 national curriculum. That's the national curriculum that we think was the best one ever written. It wasn't perfect, but it's better than ever, anything before or since. So we started, when we started writing our learning professions, progressions, we started, one of the things we started, one of our tools was the 1999 national curriculum. So if we take out this little bit here, melting, freezing, boiling and condensing can be explained in terms of the simple particle model. And these are some of the statements. They, there's a few more bullet points there. So this is the learning progression. This is the sort of science we want people to know about. So the learning intention is that they should understand the basic particle model. So that's what we want them to know. So, so you might call that, I don't know what you might call it, an objective. We want them to understand that. That's the intention at the end of the learning. They will understand that. And this, this other bit here, really, is an exemplification of that in the learning progression in terms of what we think at key stage three level this means. What do you mean by understand? You know, what do you want them to be able to do? How will we know they understand it? So the first thing is that you don't know somebody understands something unless they do something. You can't see a light bulb. Well, really you might. A child's face may light up when they suddenly understand something. But you're not entirely sure what it was that they thought they understood. So, from the learning intention, we write evidence of learning statements. These are the sort of things we think a student who understands that at key stage three will be able to do. Describe the main features of the particle model. In other words, write down a list of what they are and know what those things mean. Identify limitations in the model, understand how the model distinguishes between pure and impure substances. Use the model to explain solids, liquids, and gases. Use the model to explain changes of state. 
So those, yes. Sorry, is the evidence of learning statements that are success criteria or learning outcomes or learning terms, are they the same? They are, I think you might call them learning outcomes. Would you call them learning outcomes? People who use those that language? We haven't, deliberately haven't used the language of outcomes and objectives and yeah. things because people have, get hung up about what they are. They are what you want to see a student be able yes. to do. So if that's what you, if that's yeah, it, I yes. Understand. So yeah. at the end of your lesson, you'd like them to do some of these things, okay? If they could do all those things, you'd say, I think they understand the particle model to key stage three sort of level, if they can do those things. But that isn't enough to say, and that's what a specification might say. They might just say, understand. It might say, these are the things we want to do. But what actually do you want them to do? So then we are, are sort of, the hard bit actually, is then writing questions. So I'm going to just pick one of these, describe the main features of the particle model and show you an example of a question that we've used here. So I'd like you to read this. Are you, how many of you are, are you all science teachers? Are the people here who aren't science teachers? So there are some, there are some people not science teachers as well. Okay, so we'll see whether the science teachers get this right as well. Actually, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you what, you're, what you think the answer is, but I might ask the science teachers what they think their students might think the answer is. Now, this question um, comes from some work, research. That it's a sort of research-based question in the sense that it's been used in research to find out what students think at Key Stage 3. Phil Johnson at Durham University has done a lot of work on students' understanding of the particle model and substances, and this is one of his questions. So, when anyone would like to say what they think the correct answer is, the scientist's answer, I'll say, shall I save MD embarrassment? The scientist's answer is C. There's nothing in between the particles. Science teachers, what do you think your students would say? A. A. Anything but C. <laughs> okay, so the answer is C. And the research, now this research was done with hundreds of middle school sort of key stage three students, slightly above average overall in ability than the national picture, and 20% of them, 21% of them thought the correct answer. Air and solid copper. They imagine when you talk about particles, they imagine these particles are embedded in that copper they can see. They find it, a lot of students find it very difficult to understand that that solid copper is actually made of these particles. The particles that you talk about when you talk about the particle model are embedded in the copper they can see, a lot of them think. Can I just ask you, yes. why, do you um, why does this question show the particles as circles? Because that's quite a common particle model early on, that they're sort of, you know, sort of ball bearing circle, circle things. Well, they are, aren't they? Or is there anything? Yeah. But, but why? That's what I'm, I'm saying, why? Why is it circles? Because the model that chemists will use for a long time after that is that, that uh, atoms are sort of spherical. Because it's all a model. But that's, that's the model we have is that they're, they are, that they're spheres. And then, as, as you, and this is one of the interesting, as you go through secondary school, these spheres become more detailed. To start with, they're just kind of ball bearings. And then in key stage four, you'll sort of say, actually, kids, they're not really just ball bearings. You know, they've got a bit in the middle and they've got these... And if you're a chemist, you tell them they've got these electrons in orbits. And if, you just, if they're a physicist, you just tell them they've got these electrons sort of hanging around. So the models, but the model is that they're, they're spherical. Thank you. Gosh. OK, so that's one question. And having this data, teachers may not even have thought about this as being an issue. Some teachers say, oh, I wouldn't even have asked that question. You know, I kind of assume that they know that there's nothing there and that what the model is like. You just wouldn't have told them what was in between. Is that it? The teachers would be teaching. Some teachers just don't, just kind of assume, yes. And yes. Then, and then it would be just maybe at the end of the unit. Yes, or it might be during a lesson. It might be that you. Not in the beginning, like, not before. Well, you might. You, well, some, you see, some children come in from primary school having been given a fairly, you know, a primary school teacher who maybe is a scientist themselves goes above and beyond what's in the primary curriculum and starts to talk about particles. So you might use it early on and say, well, what do you actually think now? You know, or you might use it later on. So, so just another quick chemistry one. 
What's in the bubbles? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. What do you think, what do you think of the, uh, the year nine students? I would if you were all scientists, I might embarrass you, but I won't since. <laughs> Ooh, that's wrong. I hope it is. <laughs> <laughs> Notice that. Got it. Oh, apologise for that. It is, the C is wrong, the wrong answer. The correct answer is B, water in the glass state. Most students said that it was oxygen or hydrogen or both, rather than being water. I'm not entirely sure that that's actually, yes. I have to go back and check actually that that's the right grid for that question now because clearly this isn't C. The, answer, the correct answer is B, water in a gas state. And it's definitely not the answer that most students say. I shall have to check that now. So these are questions we call diagnostic questions. Um, if you go to the, dent the do doctor for a diagnosis, you don't want the doctor to just say you're well or you're ill. You want the doctor to say what's wrong with you. So diagnostic questions are questions which identify the misconceptions, the misunderstandings, the things that students think, not just whether they get the right answer or not. And you can use them at the beginning of a teaching sequence. You can use them during it, during a lesson, to see whether there's progress. You can use them at any time. You might use them in tests. We're not writing these for use in end-of-topic tests. We're using, writing them for being used in, quest, in class, which is why a lot of them are sort of produced as displays. Just a quick gamble through how we see. Teachers kind of assume that students know that we see because of light. These are all models which say we see because of light, but none of them are the scientists' explanation of why we see. Some, a lot of students say, young, this is sort of age 11, 12 students, say, well, we see because there's light in the room, because the sun fills the room, because light shines on the object. Light shines on the object and we look at it, so we see it, we turn our eyes towards it, we see it. Most, and this is this research here, most students don't say that. Now, if you're a physics teacher and you haven't established that, it might explain why students don't understand what virtual images are. And I would never really thought about that, I confess, until I'd read this, into, until, I actually, until I read what Edith Gresden said. You know, she says, this is why, if you don't understand that model, then you don't, you're never going to understand what virtual images are about. But even more fundamentally, it turns out, is that students don't necessarily really believe that you need light to see. So this question, what would you see in the cupboard under the stairs? Very popular question. Um, which of those things would you see? I've got to whiz through this. Correct answer. This, these are in your little leaflet. This question is in your leaflet, although you probably can't read it. It's probably easier to read on the screen than it is in here. The correct answer is D. If there's no light getting in, the light's turned off, you'll see nothing. Lots of children will think that if you stay there long enough, you'll see something, because when they switch the light off in the bedroom at night, it's dark, and then after a bit, your eyes get used to it in their perception, and then you can see things dimly. They've seen cat's eyes shining. They think shiny things give out light. Rather than just ask that as a simple question, and this tactic, you can use it with lots of questions. Ask them how they confident they are in their answer. Do they think this is right? Do they think this is wrong? That reveals a lot about understanding. I put this question on our website, and um, a teacher, I don't know whether she's at Perpetual Motion's not here, is she? I haven't seen her. I don't know her. But she, she tweeted, I've done this, I've done this, and she tweeted this photograph, and she said, only one child in the class got it right. Most of them thought this. So she learned a lot by using that kind of a question. She then went on and used the same kind of thing and on, on our website, her blog. She blogs on our website about how she used diagnostic questions. She adapted it. She changed it. She had one that was an ethics. Well, she had one about um, something to do with genetics. And she, she was in a church school, so she changed it from I think this is right, I think this is wrong, to I think this is correct, I think this is incorrect because she didn't want to get confused about whether they were talking about the ethics of whatever the question was or whether they were talking about the science of it. 
OK, last one, last example I'll show you is to do with teaching about cells. Most Key Stage 3 students think that cells are like flat pancake things, like you see under the microscope, like you see in drawings in books. If you give them some plasticine and say, make me a couple of cells, what will they make you? These are quite good, actually. But they are a bit flat. One of the things it does show is that they know that there's a variety, that not all cells are the same. They, can, they know that there's different kinds of cells. So we think this is a nerve cell. We think this is a blood cell. We're not entirely sure what we think these are. <laughs> Ciliated something or others. Uh, and that, what's that one? And what's wrong with it? It's got chloroplasts in it. So you get some additional misconception. Not only did this person draw a flat line diagram when given some plasticine, but they also put in some, they went to another group to get some green stuff to put in for their root cells. Root cells aren't green. Now, can I just tell you that this was not year seven, year eight, or year nine. These were PG, no, these were PGCE students. <laughs> Possibly not biologists. We have a science PGCE, so some of them might have been biologists, um, but it could be physicists or chemists as well. Last, last question. POE. How many science teachers here know about POE? How many science teachers here don't know about POE? I wonder heard of POE. Predict, observe, explain. Before you do the experiment, predict what you think is going to happen. Use your knowledge to explain why you think that immediately become more engaged in the experiment so that when the head comes in and wanders around and asks them what they're doing, they can tell them, I'm trying to find out this because I think this. This book here, which I can recommend, it's out of print, but I've just got a copy off Amazon secondhand. When they, what, why Gunston says, write, get them to write down. So if it's a demo, what do you think is going to happen? Do this, what do you think is going to happen? Thank you. What do you think is going to happen? Write it down. Don't talk about it. Write it down so that it's your prediction. Obse your prediction. Write down your observation so it's yours. Before you say what everybody else saw, hear what everybody else thinks they saw, you write down what you saw. And then ex reconcile. Very powerful way of finding out what students are thinking about an experiment, what their understanding is. Makes the practical work more. If you, if you haven't come across Veritasium, who writes some great, some great videos, and he makes some great videos, an Australian guy, um, that you can use if you haven't got the sort of kit to do things yourself. So this is an experiment. Very last thing. This, you've got this experiment in your sheet. This is a, for the geeky physicists amongst you. Another one, we tried it out with uh, PGC students, and they all they said, oh, the experiment doesn't work because it didn't do what they thought it was going to do. They didn't say, oh, our theory's wrong. They said, your experiment doesn't work. <laughs> so, rules don't work unless you use them all. What we found out is it's really hard to write good questions. Um, and it's really hard to uh, um, cover some of the topics, such as how science works, which is now called... What's it called in the new, in new national curriculum? It's gone out of my head. Scientific. Working scientifically, yes. Um, but we're working on all of that. Dylan Williams says, sharing high quality questions is the best thing we could do, which is what we're trying to do, is to create these high quality questions. That's the book. Yes, if you want to know about embedded, how to do embedded formative assessment, that's the most readable thing out there. So what we're trying to do is convince teachers to use these kinds of questions in the course of their teaching. And that means CPD as well as writing stuff. I'm sorry, that was a real bit of a gallop through. Uh, I, should, I, should, uh, I meant to introduce Alistair, but he was off getting me a glass of water at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Alistair is, I'm Mary Useg, for those people who've come here via Twitter. Alistair uh, has just joined us at York, and he's AM Useg. If you want to know more, do get in touch. <laughs>